Thanks so much for checking out this message from LifeGate Church. We hope that God uses this message to encourage you and help you grow deeper in your faith. G'day, thanks for joining us. My name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor of LifeGate Church. I've got a message I want to share with you today around the birth of Jesus. We're going to pray and then we're going to dive in. I encourage you to pray with me. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, that it was your plan to send your son Jesus to be born as a baby, to grow to be a man, to die and to rise, to ascend and now seat at the right hand of you. Father, we thank you for Jesus, that he gives us life, that he forgives our sin, all because of your kindness and your love for us. As we come to your word today, God, give us ears, hearts open to hear from you. Transform our lives. Encourage us, move us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, do you know, as I share this message today, there is only six more sleeps until Christmas. That's right, six more sleeps until Christmas. Hasn't Christmas come very fast this year? Here's a question for you. Are you looking forward to Christmas? Are you looking forward to Christmas? Now, for some of us, we love Christmas. We love the food and the presents and the shopping and the decorations and the singing, and the family, and all the parts of Christmas, we love it. But for other people, you know, Christmas is a more of a difficult time, something that they don't look forward to because of all the things I just said, because of the food and the amount of preparation that's involved, because of the shopping, because the shops are so busy, because of all the gifts, and you've got to write your lists, lists and work out what you're going to buy for each person, which can be really stressful and difficult. And then you've got the family gathering, and sometimes that can be difficult depending on who's in your family. But then we can also remember those who we've lost over the last year, who was with us last Christmas, but not with us this Christmas. Christmas, Christmas can be a really difficult time. Today I want to share with you around two extraordinary people who are very much looking forward to Christmas. We see these two people appear in Luke's Gospel, in Luke chapter 2. And these two extraordinary people were very much looking forward to Jesus coming into the world, God's Messiah coming into the world, because they were super passionate about seeing God's will fulfilled. And that's our big title for today. They desired to see God's will fulfilled. And because they saw it in Jesus, they were so excited about it. The context of uh, Luke chapter 2, let's go back to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we see um, the gospel starts with the birth of John the Baptist. And we have all the accounts around that. And then we have an angel coming to Mary and saying that she's going to have a baby. Then in Acts chapter two, uh, Acts, Luke chapter 2, we, we're told that Caesar Augustus issues a decree that everyone's to go to their hometown for a census, which was most probably around paying taxes to Rome. And so Joseph and Mary, Mary's pregnant, goes to Bethlehem. They give birth to their son, Jesus. Then shepherds are out in the fields, and the angels sing, and they tell the, and they tell the shepherds to go and see this baby that's born, and they celebrate the birth of this baby. And then after that, we're told that Joseph and Mary have Jesus circumcised on the eighth day, as were the custom. God wanted his people circumcised to separate the Jews from the Gentiles. And then after 40 days, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus went to the temple for purification and offering the, the offering to buy back the firstborn. We can't go into that today, but you can read that. It's in Luke's gospel. And then while they're at the temple, after 40 days of Jesus being born, 40 days after Jesus was born, they have these encounters with Simeon and Anna. These two incredible people who were looking forward to the birth of the Messiah. So what we're going to do now is jump to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 25 and pick up the account. Remember, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are at the temple, and they meet this guy named Simeon. Here we go. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. An important verse. It was revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. 
When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, this is his prayer, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that he will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. As we look at this little um, passage in Luke, I want to pull out three things about Simeon. The first thing is the description of Simeon, what Luke wrote about Simeon describing him. The first thing is that he was a righteous and devout. Now, that word righteous, that's, there is only one way to be righteous, and that's by God seeing you as righteous. Now, as Luke wrote this, he might have been talking around Simeon's desire to live a righteous life, but more likely, I reckon it's similar to what Abraham um, experienced in Genesis 15 and also in Romans 4, where it says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And I reckon that's the case here too for Simeon. He put his faith and belief in God, and therefore God said, because of your faith, because of your belief in me, I'm giving you a righteous standing in my sight. Really beautiful. And the other thing is that he's described as devout, devout to the Lord. We're told that the Holy Spirit was on him. We're told that the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would see the Messiah before he died, and that the Holy Spirit led him to the temple. He wasn't at the temple. The Spirit nudged him and said, go to the temple, and he went, and that's where he saw the Messiah. Some beautiful descriptions of Simeon. The next thing I want to pull out, pull, pull out is Simeon's description of Jesus. And this is how he describes Jesus. He says, this is your salvation. This is in the prayer where he says, Sovereign Lord. He goes, I, am, I have seen your salvation. He, Jesus is God's salvation for humanity. It is, Jesus is his rescue plan. Jesus is the one who born but grew up to be a man died on that cross and as he died on that cross he made a way for my sin and your sin to be forgiven and when he rose from the dead he 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 was the first one to rise from the dead and as the first one to rise from the dead he offers me and you new life if we put our faith in him jesus is god's rescue plan that's why he's described as god's salvation and then it says he is for all nations not just for the jews but for the gentiles too that is everyone who walk from this planet. The way to be saved is through Jesus. That's the second thing, Simeon's description of Jesus. The third thing I want to look at is Simeon's desire. And the first thing Simeon desires in verse 25 is the consolation of Israel. The consolation to console is to alleviate grief or to take away a sense of loss or trouble. You know, Israel had been through... (laughs) Many difficulties, they were in Egypt, they came out and then they honored God for a season and they rebelled against God and other nations came against them and right now, Rome has authority over that nation. It's been a really difficult time and how were they going to be consoled? Well, it was through the Messiah. Isaiah 41 talks about the Messiah who was going to comfort his people. Simeon desired that Israel would be comforted and how were they going to be comforted? Is through this Messiah. And then in verse 26, he says that he has, now seen Je- he has now seen Jesus, who is God's Messiah, the one who he was desiring to see. Why? Because Simeon was deliberate and passionate about seeing God's will fulfilled. His whole life was about seeing God's will fulfilled. The thing that I think stirs me the most is in verse 29 here. It says, in this prayer that Simeon prays, he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He was living just to see the Messiah. It was revealed to him that he would see the Messiah before he died. So, so every day is today the day, is today the day. Because Simeon was all sold out 
His whole life was about seeing God's will fulfilled and any incredible man. The second person we're going to look at is Anna, who follows on from this story in verse 36. This is what it says. This is Anna's account of encountering Jesus. There was also a prophet named Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to who all were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Let me say that again. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the, to the redemption of Jerusalem. As we look at Anna's story, I want to also pick out these three things. Firstly, the description of Anna. In verse 36, she's described as a prophet, someone who heard from God and then proclaimed God's truth to his people. She's described as very old. We're told that she lived with her husband seven years. Now, at the time, women were married young, most probably at the age of about 14. And, at the, and being married at 14, having a husband for seven years, maybe he passed at the age of 21. And then she was a widow from 21 through to 84. Now, does that mean she got married at 84? Because it says she was a widow, a widow from 21 to 84. She got married at 84. Or she passed at 84. We don't know. But we're told that during this time, during this time, this 21 to 84, she worshipped, fasted, and prayed night and day at the temple. She worshipped, fasted, and prayed. This woman, again, was all about God, God's purpose, God's will for her life, but also for God's people, the people of Israel. And as a result, she worshipped, fast, fasted, and prayed. The second thing is Anna's description of Jesus. Look at what she says about Jesus in verse 38. She declares Jesus to be the Messiah, and she describes him as the Redeemer of Jerusalem. Now, the Redeemer means simply to, be, to buy back. How did Jesus buy back Jerusalem? Well, firstly, if you talk about the people, the people had wandered from God for many years, and they were living their own way. Even at the time of Jesus, they were so far off track. And God's Messiah came back to God's Messiah came to set things right, to show them the way of living, to show them the way of holiness, and to die on that cross and make their lives right with God. But it's also around the physical place of Jerusalem. You know, right now Jesus has set up a spiritual kingdom where he is king. But one day at his return, he's going to set up a physical kingdom with the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And everybody who belongs to him will be at that place in Jerusalem and no doubt in the surrounding places because there's so many people. But Jerusalem is going to be restored to the place where God is, where he's worshipped and served. It's a beautiful picture. Anna describes Jesus as the Messiah. And the third thing we see is Anna's desire. And through the worship, through the way she fasted, through the way she prayed, she was deliberate about seeing God's will fulfilled. An incredible woman. An incredible woman. Now, as I was preparing this message and as I was reading through the book of Luke, I asked myself this question. I asked myself, why are these events here? We have the angels and the shepherds and, and the birth of Jesus, and all that makes sense. But why would you have the accounts of Simeon and Anna? Why are they there in Luke's gospel? No other gospel records it. Nowhere else do we see it in the Bible. But Luke records it. And my question is, why are the events with Sam, Simeon and Anna there in Luke's gospel? Well, as I was thinking about it, I reckon there's two reasons. The first reason is because it adds validity to the text and adds validity to who Jesus is. Simeon was widely respected by the people. The people knew him as a man who was righteous and devout and who was led by the Spirit, hence the descriptions upon him. And then we have Anna, who is very old, and is worshipped and fasted and prayed. She's also a woman who is highly, highly respected in the community. And when these two highly respected people say he's the Messiah, well, people would have taken notice. The second reason I think these events are here is because Luke is celebrating people of faith. Anna and Simeon were people of faith, and he celebrates them in, in his description of them. 
And what I want us to do for a few moments is to look at Simeon and look at Anna and their life and to say, how does their life compare with our lives? Could we say these things that's said of them of our lives? So let's have a look at it. Firstly, the description of Simeon. He's described as righteous and devout. Could you describe yourself as righteous and devout? If you're speaking to a Christian brother or sister or someone in your family who knows you, would they say that you are righteous and devout? Now, firstly, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, you are righteous because that is how God sees you. When you're a Christian, God says to you, you're now forgiven and I see you as right in my sight. So in one sense, you're right, but are you living in a righteous way? Are you living a devout life where, where everybody knows that Jesus is the number one person in your life, that your whole life is about him? Would you be described as righteous and devout? And devout, that is a huge challenge for me and no doubt you as you're watching this. Simeon, Simeon is described where the Holy Spirit is on him. Would people describe you as someone who the Holy Spirit is on? How do they know the Holy Spirit is on you? Well, maybe it's to do with the fruit of the Spirit. Are you displaying love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, self-control, faithfulness? Are you, are you um, displaying the fruit of the Spirit? Are you working in the gifts of the Spirit? Are you using the gifts that God has given you for his purpose and glory? Would you be described as someone where the Holy Spirit is on them? Then, Simeon was, Simeon was told by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Messiah before he died. Would you be someone who's described as someone who hears from the Holy Spirit where God speaks to them? Are you someone who opens the Word of God and as you're reading the Rima Word, the Word pops out at the page and, and that's what God's saying to you today? When you pray, does, does a God drop thoughts and ideas and pictures and visions in your heart and your mind? These are the people that God wants, people who are led by His Spirit, who are spoken to by His Spirit. And then we have this final one where the Holy Spirit led him into the temple. He wasn't in the temple but God said by Spirit, Simeon, go to the temple now. And as he goes, he finds the Messiah. Are you someone who's led by the Spirit? Are you someone who, where, the, where God speaks to you? You follow it. The promptings of the Spirit. Recently, Michelle and I were offered a, a business opportunity, and I was excited about it, and Michelle wasn't. And she had a check in her spirit. All right, God, you're saying no. So we said no because we were led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit means saying yes to some things. And says it means saying no to other things because we want to follow where he wants us. I wonder if you could describe yourself like Simeon is described here. Then we go to Anna's description. She's described as a prophet. Now, for us today, how do you see yourself? Do you, do you see yourself as the way the world speaks about you as not enough, not good enough, failure, all these things? Or do you see yourself as God sees you, as his workmanship created in Christ Jesus? Do you see yourself as forgiven and loved and chosen? Do you see yourself as God sees you? Because as you do, you can say, I am loved. I am important. I am valued because of what God has done in me. And then knowing who you are, do you live from that place? Anna prophesied because she was a prophet. As a child of God, do you love others as a child of God? And if you know your gifting, if you're gifted in leadership or mercy or compassion or evangelism or pastor, teacher, whatever the gift, are you walking in the gift that God has given you? Because that's what we see Anna doing and that's what God wants us to do, walk in the gifts, walk in their identity that our God has given us. She's described as someone who is very old and, and I described what that was about earlier. But the comment I want to make here is that we need to honour those who are older. You know, I'm in my mid-40s, I'm like mid-life now. And as, as a younger person, I don't think I showed the older ones the respect as I should. And young people think older people are out of touch, not relevant, not trendy. And maybe they're not that trendy. But let me tell you, older people have walked life. And they've got wisdom that younger people cannot get until they actually walk through life. And so we need to honor our older people, respect them, learn from them, glean from them, sit with them, grab their wisdom, their life experience, and that will help us um, and protect us from many mistakes that they've made. Let's honor people who are older. And then Anna is described as someone who worshipped, fasted, and prayed night and day. 
I wonder if that looks like you. Do you spend time daily in worship? Do you take time to fast? And when you fast, you fast, your body becomes alert and your spirit becomes alert to God where you're more aware of him and what he's doing. How often do you pray? And this woman prayed all the time, all day, all night. She worshiped, fasted, and prayed. And that's not practical for all of us because of work and stuff. But we can have an attitude of wanting to honor God to pray and fast. Incredible descriptions of who these people are. And then we see their description of Jesus, Simeon and Anna's description of Jesus, and they described him as the Messiah. Messiah means anointed one, chosen one. God said from way back in Genesis chapter 3 that he was going to send someone to rescue his people. He was going to rescue them, the anointed one. Do you see Jesus as the Messiah? How do you view him? Maybe you're watching this message today and you've never committed your life to Jesus. Maybe this Christianity thing is, is all new to you. Well, let me tell you that God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus, the Messiah, to come into the world, the anointed one to rescue you. What did you need rescuing from? You need rescuing from death because of your sin. The Bible teaches us because of our sin, because of our wrongdoing, we deserve death. But God loved you, that God loved me so much that he sent this Messiah, Jesus, to die on a cross, to rise from the dead, that we can be forgiven of sin, have relationship with God, and have new life. And if you see him as the Messiah, if you put your trust in him, you can have that forgiveness. You can have that relationship with God. You can have that new life and live with God forever in eternity, if you see him as the Messiah. The third thing we see around Simeon and Anna is, that the, is their desire. And their desire was seeing God's will fulfilled. Their life was all about God and what God wanted. We see it in the descriptions of them. It, their lives were all about God and honoring Him and pleasing Him with every part of their life. I wonder if you could describe yourself like that, where your whole life is about loving God, serving God, and seeing His will Fulfilled. I wonder if you could describe yourself like that. Just imagine for a moment, God decided to write part two of the Bible. <laughs> now, this is obviously, you can't add to the scriptures, all that sort of stuff. So I'm not being heretical here. I'm just getting you to imagine. And part two of the Bible was full of people of faith, exceptional people whose whole life was about seeing God's will fulfilled. And people wrote it down as, as our God led them. And these people of history, and even today are in this book, people, of, people who are passionate about seeing God's will fulfilled. I wonder if you would be in that book. Would you describe yourself as someone who is all about God's will, all about his purpose and seeing his purpose and his will fulfilled? That's the people that would be in this book, and I wonder if you would be included. I wonder if you'd want to be included. And if you don't want to be, there's something you really got to question, but we should all want to be, if we're Christians, we'd all want to be in that book of the standout, faithful followers of Jesus throughout history. I wonder if you'd be in that book. I reckon... One of the biggest challenges for us is this tension between my will and God's will. And there's this thing that, we, that is within me, and it's true in my own life, that I desire God's will, like in Romans 7, where, where, where Paul writes, I, I uh, want to do what God wants me to do, but there's this fight within me to do what I want rather than what God wants. And I don't do what I do, what I do, what I do, what I, and he does all that do's and I don't. But there's this thing within me where I want to honor God and do his will, but I also have this flesh nature that's still within me, and it rises up where I go, I want to do what I want. And there's this battle, and so often God's will doesn't win out in our lives. It's rather our will wins out because we're so focused on us and our life and our way and our job and our finance and our family and our resource and our hobbies and our way of living. And we lose sight of what God wants and his will and his way and going after what, he's, what, what he desires and partnering with him and seeing his will fulfilled. And that is what God wants. Rather than us fulfilling what we want, he wants us for us to, feel what, to fulfill what he wants. It really comes down to the lordship of Jesus in our lives. 
You know, when we become a Christian, we accept Jesus as both Savior and Lord, and we love the Savior part, where we recognize that we're sinful and we deserve eternal death. That God loved us and gave us his son Jesus that we can be forgiven and have a relationship with God and have eternal life. And Jesus saves us and he gives us eternal life and we go, woohoo! But the Bible says when we accept Jesus, he's not only our saviour, he's also our Lord. Which means he's the boss, he's the king, he's the one who's calling the shots. And that means for us is that we live a life where we say, Jesus, how do you want me to live? What's my next step? What's the choices you want me to make? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to love? Who? Where? It's about coming under his lordship. And it really comes down to the battle of the will where we say, Jesus, I choose you as my Lord. I choose you as my Savior and my Lord. And we choose to come under him. And we choose to serve him. So as you talk about God's will, I want to come, I, I want to give you a brief summary of what God's will is. What is God's will? And as we talk about what is God's will, we can talk about it in many different ways. There's many parts of God's will that we see throughout Scripture. But if I was going to summarize it simply for you, something you can take home, I reckon we can most, summarily, most simplify it. Um, we, can grab, we can grab the summary simply. That's what I'm trying to say. Where is Jesus' will? Where is God's will for us? Simply stated. And I reckon we see it in the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he says, pray this way. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I think here we have a beautiful summary of what God's will is for us. The first thing is that we pray to God the Father and then we are to hallowed be his name. Hallowed means that God is holy, he's separate, he's unique, he's unlike anyone else in the most amazing way. And when it says to hallow him is to honor him, is to celebrate him for who he is. Hallowed be your name. And when it talks about his name, his name is the fullness of who God is, all his attributes. Holy are you in the fullness of who you are. Magnificent, you are praiseworthy. And the first thing around God's will for us is that we honor him, we worship him, we celebrate him. The second thing is around your kingdom come. The second thing Jesus wants us to pray is that your kingdom come. And, and God's kingdom right now is a spiritual kingdom where Jesus is the king. Where, and, and, and to have a kingdom, it's about having the king's domain where Jesus is king. And right now it's not a physical kingdom. As I said, it's a spiritual kingdom. And you enter that kingdom by putting your faith in Jesus. It's about saying, Jesus, I choose you. I want you as my Lord. I want you as my King. I'm entering your kingdom. That's the second thing, that we choose to come under the authority of the King. Jesus, you are my King. I choose to live your way. That's the second thing, coming under the authority of the King. And then the third thing, Jesus' prayer is that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As someone who is under the authority of the King, because I'm part of his domain, I'm part of his rule, I choose to live in a way that pleases him. And how is that? On earth as it is in heaven. The things that we see in heaven, love, kindness, all the stuff that we see in God's presence, worship, loving, celebrating, a great banquet, all those things that we see now on earth, where people are healed because there's no sickness in heaven where people are saved because there's no death in heaven, where people's lives are transformed and renewed because there's no brokenness in heaven. That is what we're to see now on earth. So not only are we to honor him, number one, celebrate him as God and worship him, number two, come under his authority as we recognize him as our king and we're part of his kingship, number three, we're to live a life that pleases him, live in the way that he wants us to which is around drawing people to Jesus, which is around laying our hands on the sick and seeing them recover. It's around loving people and seeing people's lives restored and healed and transformed and minds renewed and people set free from their bondage. This is what we're to see on the earth. There is a beautiful summary of what it looks like to see God's will fulfilled. So as we come to the end of this message, how deliberate are you in seeing God's will fulfilled. How passionate are you 
in seeing God's will fulfilled. I shared a message a couple of weeks ago around the feasts, and I spoke around Pentecost. And right now we're in this season until the last trumpet sound. And until that last trumpet when Jesus returns, well, that's the end and where we're going to go and be with him forever. But right now we're in this moment where we're called to worship him, where we're called to live under his authority, where Jesus is king in his spiritual kingdom, and we're to live his way as part of his kingdom. And part of that is sharing this great love that God has given us with the world, that God's son, Jesus, has come, born as a baby, grew to be a man, died on the cross, rose again to give me a new life. That's part of the message that God wants us to proclaim as part of his will. So as we come to the end of this message, we see in Simeon and Anna incredible people of faith, incredible people who lived a life who were all about God's will. They desired to see his will fulfilled. And so here's the question for you. Where do I need to pursue God's will rather than my own? As you're challenged by Simeon's life, as you're challenged by Anna's life, and fulfilling God's will for your life, where do you need to pursue God's will rather than my own? Where are the areas where you're all after your, your will rather than God's will? I want you to spend 30 seconds. I want you to pause. I want you to reflect. I want you to pray. And if you find yourself thinking, as the Holy Spirit allows, areas where you're pursuing your will rather than God's will, I want you to repent of that, which simply means recognizing your wrongdoing, asking God to forgive you, and choose to live His way. Take 30 seconds, consider this question. Let's pray. Father, we see people like Simeon and Anna and we go, wow, people of incredible faith. And we look throughout history and we see the Christians who have risen up over the years who have done incredible things for you. Father, we want to be like that. We want to be devout. We want to be people of worship and prayer. We want to be people who are led by your spirit, guided by your spirit. We want to be people where you speak to us, we're listening to you, and we're obedient to your word. We want to be people where our whole life is about fulfilling your will, your purpose for our lives. Father, change us. Give us a passion to see your will fulfilled in our lives. Make that the burning desire of our heart. The burning desire of our heart would be to live your way, to see your will fulfilled. God, in our own strength, we can't do it, but you can do it. So we ask now by your Spirit that you would move in us, that you would change us, that you'll put those will, that will and desire in us to see your will fulfilled on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being part of this. It's a real privilege to have um, to share this with you. Have an incredible Christmas. See you Christmas Day. Thanks so much for checking out this message. LifeGate Church has people meeting in person and online in many different locations, and we'd love to help you get connected. My name is Andrew, and I lead our online team here at LifeGate Church, and it's our job to do exactly that. We'd love to support you, help you get connected, and find out how you can take your next steps. So why don't you head to lifegate.org.au slash online and we'd love to find out more about you and how we can serve you as a church. Thanks for checking out this message and we'll catch you soon.